Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh oh, it's going to be one of those crowds. <laughs> Uh, my name is Fiona. I'd like to make you all very welcome this evening. Just a quick housekeeping message. This is a chance for you now to turn your phones to silent. Uh, do feel free to use as much social media as you would like to. Um, you'll find both John and Andrew uh, very active on Twitter. Um, and also the publishers of um, Andrew's Fine Book are also on Twitter, as is Avid Reader. So um, it's a great pleasure and great honour for us to be launching Andrew's book tonight, Talking Smack. We've been following Andrew's career, um, career quite closely for a few years now, and so we were very proud and delighted to be asked to launch his book. Um, we were even more proud when we found out that John Birmingham was going to come and do the honours for us. John Birmingham is a passionate um, author, journalist and gourmand. <laughs> I thought you were going to say drug addict. <laughs> now what you did in the privacy of Belimba is it stays in Belimba. Um, but we are very pleased that John chooses to live in Brisbane as well. Um, the, the format for this evening is these guys will have a chat and there'll be time for questions and then of course there'll be a signing. We'll have Andrew in the window signing copies of his new book. Can I ask you to um, join me in welcoming Andrew and John. So, don't play it, mate. That's a good book, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you did well with that. <laughs> no, you did better, actually. I, um, uh, you should go, after we finish up here, you should go read this book, because uh, I, I always resist these events. I always, like, I, I greet at them and I think, oh, I'm just, so much trying to do. And then I started reading Andrew's book and I just, you know, gobbled most of it up in, uh, in one sitting, I'm afraid. It's, it's awesome. Um, why don't you tell us what it is? How the, how the idea came to you and, and, and how you went about doing it? Yeah, I wanted to write a book, but I needed permission to do that first. Uh, I've been reading books as long as I've been breathing, essentially. My father's a librarian, and uh, from the youngest age I was reading books on a regular basis. But I started uh, writing as a journalist uh, about five years ago and slowly built up a portfolio of ideas. I started in music and gradually spread out into kind of a, a wide range of a general approach to journalism, feature journalism. And uh, I thought around this time when the, the publisher approached me, Alexandra Payne, my publisher at University of Queensland Press, had been following my career for a while. And she said that she was going to ask me to write a music book. But by that point, I had written about such a, a wide range of things she wasn't sure. She just said, do you want to write a book, essentially? And I went back, well, I said yes, initially. Then I went back and thought about what I might like to do. And at that time in my life, I had started experimenting with recreational drugs, which is something that I had avoided quite studiously up until that point in my life. Uh, I had abused alcohol from my mid-teens, as many Australians do. I'd smoked a few joints here and there during college, but everything else scared the shit out of me, basically. But around that time in 2012, when Alex approached me, I was experimenting cautiously with other things and I was becoming more fascinated with something that I had thought wasn't for me or that was for <coughs> losers and villains and evil people who decide to take things that aren't government sanctioned drugs or government regulated drugs. So you, you reckon it was the, uh, the, the music writing background that, that led you down this the particular path? That would, for those of you who don't know, the, the book is a bunch of really quite fascinating interviews and, and Sort of almost profile interviews, really, of musicians talking about their. Um, actually, some of them aren't talking about their, their drug use, aren't they? Some of them are actually quite straight and quite clean, and they, they talk about the, the the pressures of being in an industry where everyone around them is, is ripped off their nut. But the uh, the book, yeah, it's how many how many musicians? Fourteen interviews. Yeah. So was that was it your background working for for Street Press and Music Mag that made you think that'd be worth doing? Yeah, I wanted to, well, I've been a long-term music fan, obviously, writing about music as a professional, but yeah, I guess I wanted to look at the intersection between drugs and music, and so some of the people who I approached for the book I had spoken to before 
through my work for magazines and websites, but many of them I hadn't met before didn't know me from a bag of dog shit. They just they got my response. Oh, sorry, they got my request to talk to them. So how would you do that? Like, I mean, some I imagine just you, you front it up, but others you go through like management and. Well, yeah, they were all email requests. It wasn't right. meeting someone at a gig and like bailing them out backstage and saying, "Hey, mate." What do you mean, yeah. drug, dude? No. So yeah, I was very, <laughs> I guess, professional in that sense. I kind of said that. I explained my briefly my history of uh, being afraid of drugs and then coming to understand that it's quite uh, sensationalized and hysteria lit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so I emailed the request through to either them directly or their management and we went from there. Did, did you find yourself when you were approaching them uh, in a sort of um, vomity confessional mode? Like, you know, Look, I've used a shitload of drugs myself, and yada yada yada, and you know, the media, oh my god, the fucking media sucks, and I just want to sit straight, and, and you know, I won't fuck you, honestly. Have you been listening to my recordings? <laughs> it's eerie. No, no, I can just imagine. Uh, it's, it, one of the difficulties when you do work like this is you, you come to it uh, not just with your own history, and, and Andrew's got a, you know, a, a very impressive history as a, a freelance writer. The, the, the pool of successful freelancers in Australia is quite small, and we we tend to keep the side eye on each other very closely. Um, as you know, he might be taking my feed one day. <laughs> he's well, he's well, well capable of doing it. But um, one of the things that, uh, yeah, one of the things you, you have to put up with when you do this kind of work is the the crap job that other people have done. And did you hit resistance? because of the um, poor performance of the mass media on this issue? To an extent, yeah. The first person to say yes to my request was Phil Jamison from Grinspoon. And he had essentially been fucked over by the mainstream media because his face and uh, story appeared on the front cover of the Daily Telegraph with the headline, Stars Ice Hell, after it was leaked to the paper that he was in uh, detox for crystal methamphetamine addiction. So he, from that point on, he was on the back foot defending his story. He no longer had control of it. It was something he was trying to keep private between he, him and his family and his bandmates. This is the singer from Grinspoon. And uh, from there, he was on the back foot defending himself. So a few more months after that, he appeared on Enough Rope, Andrew Denton's program, to kind of explain himself in his own words, which he felt he had to do because it had just been taken from him. It was no longer his story. It was something that he uh, had to defend. So with the book, I think he was the first one to say yes. And uh, this is probably the last time he's going to talk about it, to be honest, because he's, he's had a, a shit time um, being portrayed as this villain for deciding to use a drug, which he did, then became addicted to for a short period of time. So yeah, I had a lot of resistance from... I, I drew up a long list of like 100 musicians that I wanted to talk to and many of them said no, or never got back to me, or their management kept me at arm's length, but ultimately 14 had the, uh, I don't know if courage is the right word, but the, the interest enough to talk about this topic frankly, which is pretty rare, I think. And can you recall off the top of your head who they are? Aren't they on this poster? Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. Paul Kelly, Tina Arena, Gautier, Steve Kilby, Holly Throsby, Earthboy, Mick Hardy, John Tuber, Bertie Blackman, plus more. Possible. <laughs> um, did you? One of the things I, I found as I was reading it was that, that I got the feeling that certain you know, thematic patterns began to emerge. Did you feel that at all when you were putting it together? Hmm, it's hard to say because what I found. I, I know that you very uh, determinedly did them as separate pieces so that each person got their own voice and their own um, their own story I guess but yeah. you do see I, I felt that you, you did see uh, there was patterns that came again and again like uh, one of the things that was interesting is like we we come at uh, these people we come at their public personas and part of the public personas is is the drug use and, and the wildlife but I was quite surprised at the number of them who like you had gone into the biz and drifted into the Grundies later on. But, uh, yeah, that's right. Bertie Blackman had an interesting point on that. Uh, she is an indie pop singer based in Melbourne. Uh, her father is Charles Blackman, quite a well-known visual artist who has since uh, developed alcoholic dementia. And Bertie herself, in her early career, found herself slipping into alcoholism, essentially, because she 
was playing late shows late at night, arriving at venues in the mid-afternoon. Not much else to do in the, you know, the, the six hours in between, but sit around and drink, she found. So, and also she, I mean, in her, she was quite honest about feeling the, the pressure to play the role of um, you know, the gnarly rock singer. The image, yeah. yeah. Even though people in the band around her who just wanted to get to work and play the gig and go home and go to bed because they got a meeting with their accountant the next morning, <laughs> didn't necessarily want to encourage that. Yeah, I, I think we as a society, whether it's through pop culture or through the media, we tend to expect certain things of our rock stars and pop stars. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to look at this particular creative industry with the book, because we kind of expect them to be living these lives of wild excess and hedonism and perhaps uh, doing things that we ourselves can't do if we are living nine to five existences. And there's the other element too, isn't there, is that the, the sort of creative amplification which you touched on at the start of the book, was it the, the, the Bill Hicks quote saying that, you know, if you're against drugs, you might as well just burn all your records there. Because all the people who enhance your lives through creating that music, they were real fucking high on drugs too. Yeah, that's right. Did, that's a, a joke, obviously. It's it a, is a joke. Painting um, with a board brush. But I mean, it's if you you go through the still Steve Kilby interview, um, he talks about the quite profound effect that his drug use had on one particular album. Was it Priest? Priest yeah. equals aura, ninety eight two. Yeah. It uh, it's uh, yeah he and it, it's that's one of the someone like me who doesn't really understand music. That was a fascinating interview to read because uh, I. He lays out step by step how the drug use affected what went into the album, and, and you know what's going into your ears years later on if you're you're reading it. Uh, but then on the other hand, you get a very definite impression from quite a few of the people you interviewed that it fucked them as well. Like it, it, it didn't help the creativity at all. It's a pretty del delicate balance to try and find ultimately. Those who who I spoke to who used drugs successfully, quote unquote, were those who seem to be able to keep a distinction between their work and their recreation. I'm thinking of people like Earthboy and Ian Hogue from Powderfinger and Holly Throsby, uh, people for whom drugs were something to do on the weekend, perhaps, rather than, you know, midday on a Thursday or something like that. Okay. Do you, did you come to any conclusions at the end, like a, a sort of, you know, a, a systemic conclusion that the drugs do help, or it, it really just does come down to the, the individual? Um, well, Paul Kelly said something interesting, which is that he, he used heroin recreationally for about 20 years, is how he tells it, which is something that you don't hear very often with heroin. Usually it's a drug of extremes. You either become addicted and overdose and die, or the other narrative is that you are addicted and you get off it, mm. whereas he uh, said that he kind of walked the line, you know, walked the fence without falling victim into either outcome. But he said that ultimately it's about respect. If you don't respect what you're putting in your body, then the drugs themselves aren't going to respect you because these are powerful psychoactive substances that change your mood and behaviour. Yeah. But Kelly, of course, like we were talking about this the other day at lunch, like, uh, the, the Kelly interview as well is really, really interesting because he, if the way that Paul Kelly frames his drug history is that, yeah, it was you know the same way that you might have a cup of coffee in the morning or a glass of wine to relax at night and he'd take a ping. Uh, but reading the reading the interview and the profile, I, I got the impression that in the end the drugs were starting to to take him. Well, yeah, he had people around him who was who were kind of keeping him in line, saying, "You better keep an eye on this mate," and mm -hmm. he also took on that role with another of my interviewees, Spencer P. Jones, who himself experienced heroin addiction. And he was on, in Paul, Paul Kelly's band for a while there. And uh, Paul took him aside and said, hey, are you sure you've got this man? Is mm -hmm. it under control? And Spencer said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, don't worry. And, and Kelly had quite a terrible media experience, didn't he, with... Uh, um, Kerry O'Brien. Kerry O'Brien, yeah, the, the 7.30 interview. Yeah, the only reason that we know that Paul Kelly used heroin is because he told the world through his memoir in 2010 uh, how to make gravy he devoted four pages out of 550 plus to discussing his recreational use of heroin. And the first, and maybe the only interview he did about it was on national TV. And Kerry O'Brien dedicated five minutes out of 10 minutes to talking about his heroin use. 
because it was a grindy experience for him too, wasn't it? Like he 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 wasn't ready for that at all, even though he knew going into the interview it was almost certainly going to come up. He didn't expect Curry to keep coming at him as yeah. he could. That that uh, that uh, and I, I, it's not really off topic, but I just I wanted to ask you. I mean, you, this book's been out for a month or so now. You've been presumably been you know, running around picking it. That was all the publishing people who. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, <laughs> have, have you had any like uh, strange experiences with the the media? You sent me a link to a TV interview today. Uh, I, I I couldn't make it play, unfortunately. But it's Channel Seven. Yeah, yeah. Blame the media department. Yeah, the first. <laughs> was it the breakfast show? The morning show, which is the one after. I, I, I've done that show, I've probably done the same segment as you, about Don't Play It. It's, uh, you tell your story, I'll tell mine. <laughs> yeah, so it was my, probably my first interview about the book, and it was on national TV, live. And the way they framed it, there was a, a male and female host, and the female host was framing it, essentially asking me, is this a drug handbook? Are you advocating that everyone should take drugs? Like, what are you going to do when kids read this book? Taking a very hard line, so I had to kind of slow her down and say, no, it's about having a, a frank, honest discussion about something that's rarely discussed with any kind of candor or uh, reasonable, rational thinking. And I don't know if she bought it by the end, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll give you some media training one day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, you, John. I was on with uh, Koshi and Mel. And, um, uh, I, I, it was just it was some stoner on that show who decided to get me on there. Because these guys, they don't prepare for their interviews. They, or they just the get the up. sheet and they do the questions. And, and Koshi thought I, I, I'd written some you know, guide to how terrible drugs are. And so you know, I, I staggered in. And, yeah. As you know, book tours are great fun. Um, so I was quite shabby when I, I, I turned up there. <laughs> and uh, I knew how TV worked by then because I, I, I you know, sold my ass to Current Affair for six months at one point. And I knew as soon as we got on on stage uh, that they really they couldn't cut away because the whole schedule would fall apart. So, <laughs> Koshi asked me some ridiculous fucking question like, uh, uh, it wasn't the Ajax question, that was a Cairns radio. Tell us, tell us the Ajax question. I, I was doing uh, a, a news radio show in Cairns about uh, Duckland, and the, um, the guy asked me in all seriousness, he, he wasn't taking the piss at all, whether or not smoking dope was dangerous because uh, he heard drug dealers put Ajax in it to you know, make it more powerful. <laughs> Because she asked me something of that ilk, and I knew, like, this is live television, I'm just going to go for it. And so I started, you know, talking about you know, bucket bombs and sticky heads and how awesome it was. And poor Mel just went rigid in the chair next to me. And she was actually gripping the arms of the chair so tightly, I thought they were going to explode before the commercial break. But I knew I had four and a half minutes. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. Uh, just give us a quick overview of, of Doplan. What is Doplan? How did that come about for you? <laughs> it was, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I, I, I just finished Leviathan, which was a four and a half year uh, project to escape falafel. And um, I'd spent most of those four and a half years doing academic work in uh, Mitchell Library in Sydney. And I was just fucked by the end of it. I, you know, that the last sort of month of just putting it together, I was beginning to obsess and I had the fear, you probably, probably had this too, you know, where well, you know publication is coming and you just, you, you're feared that you've made some horrible mistake somewhere. In your case, you know, you probably, this whole book's a horrible mistake. <laughs> Kerry O'Brien's going to crucify me. <laughs> in, in mine, it was, you know, I get the sort of, you know, the dominant architectural style of North Ryde in the year 1903 wrong. <laughs> some academic had had me for fucking breakfast. <laughs> and so I came out of, um, I came out of that and had lunch with Jane uh, Palfreyman, my publisher. I was at a pub up the cross. And I was just trashed. And it was the day after I'd submitted it. I said, oh, look at you, you poor old sausage. You know, would you... Would you like to do a fun book next time? And I went, yeah. <laughs> fun. So, how about you travel around the country smoking dope and writing about it? And I just, I was all over that like a cheap Chinese suit. <laughs> and also, uh, 
This is something you really should organise. Your publishers here tonight? <laughs> Where are they? Did you offer to cover his uh, bail and, and legal fees? <laughs> It wasn't have. discussed, but it wasn't necessary ultimately. Yeah, well, they should have. Every I also got an intern that would have done my jail time for me. <laughs> Perks of being a yeah. well-known author. Yeah. You'll get there, mate, don't worry. <laughs> so, did you learn anything that just, just flat out surprised you? So, not, not, not Tina Arena surprised you, but um, surprised you otherwise. Well, the thing that I wanted to steer clear of with the book was to stick away from that time that dot 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 got so high like these kind of drug stories like you read enough of them and yeah. read them in Rolling Stone or in any kind of mainstream music magazine and they get a bit tedious so I didn't want to do that I wanted to have an honest frank discussion about someone's life through the lens of their drug use or otherwise because uh, Gautier is one of my interviewees and he himself has abstained from drugs and alcohol and yet he's one of our most successful musicians of all time but uh, what surprised me um, well there's no real single story when it comes to drug use not that I was expecting that but the fact that there are so many reasons why people choose to use things or not I wanted to look at each of them under a magnifying glass and kind of trace how that's affected their creativity as well which is something that we discussed with, with Steve Kilby for example who was trying to essentially mimic the effects of opiates through his music, which he did quite well. He and the church did quite well on um, Priest Equals Aura, but as he readily admits, kind of went downhill after that point because he was in the group of heroin addiction. Keep talking. I had a brilliant question and, and yeah, it's gone. So. Steve Kilby is a pretty interesting case because he was addicted to heroin for 11 years and he's in his late 50s now and he looks fit as a fiddle. Like He looks yes, he like does. he could beat the shit out of me in an arm wrestle and I'm 30 years younger than him, essentially. So he's a surfer, he goes on bushwalks, and like he plays gigs around the world, and he writes hit songs, and as you were saying to me, he happens to t uh, take drugs, he smokes weed. What's the problem? Like, put me up against any bloke who sits on the couch drinking beer and e eating steak, and uh, he thinks he'll win, and yeah, I reckon he would yeah, too. No, that, that, that's a really telling <coughs> line in that book. Like, he, he comes across as, you know, quite the sort of aging ninja. <laughs> you know, him. And, that, that, and that's actually re re reminded me what I wanted to ask. Is that when you, you interviewed 14 musicians, some of whom had quite terrible drug problems, some of whom were just, you know, never touched the stuff, mate. Um, and there are lessons to be learned, particularly like anybody who's brushed up against drug culture, because you know, there's a lot to recognise in that book at, at both ends. Um, do you think, though, that the, the, the lessons that these guys are offering are specific to the world they inhabit? Because their world is very different from ours. I, I think it was Bertie uh, who was, and correct me if I'm wrong because it might not have been, uh, but it might have been Bertie who was talking about, um, you know, when you, you, you think of... Uh, you think of rock and roll, wild men and women, you know, you, you think of the drinking and the, the drugs and so on. And you see, you know, there's a shitload of people like that out in the suburbs just getting up and going to work and putting in their nine to five and then smashing it three or four nights a week just as hard as, as anybody up on stage. But because that doesn't define our understanding of them, that's not what we think of them, you know, we think of them as Phil from Accounts, you know, not Phil the binge an idiot. And it's not Phil's job, Phil from Account's job, to talk about himself. Like, that's essentially the role that we expect of musicians as well, to be in the public eye and to talk about themselves in the promotional circuit. And, yeah, people like accountants, bankers, lawyers, all these industries that don't require you to ever talk to a journalist and therefore share your story. That's the big, hidden, uh, silent majority of drug users in Australia, I suppose. So maybe that's my next book. Did you Bankers on... <laughs> It's a great, um, <laughs> your brother is a, a cartoonist, and a really good cartoonist too, and has a great um, nice sort of comic history at the back of the book of the, the war on drugs, or what I like to think, call it, the war on some drugs. And uh, he starts that with a, a sort of mention of Milton Friedman, the economist, who looked at the start of the war on drugs, just thought, oh my God, this is going to go terribly, which is, I, I love because I agree with it. Um, one of the things about uh, 
good. One of the things about drugs is that it's a market. People forget that. It's a, it, it's a market and it's massive. It's, it's, it's hundreds of billions of dollars, possibly a trillion dollar global market if you get through the market. One, one thing I remember from dope, I don't remember much, is that uh, dope is the third biggest cash crop in Australia. In fact, it might be even bigger now. Back then it was big, only by wheat and I think barley. And, and when you have a, a market that size, market forces come into play. And so you can make a, you can make a giant bust over here and a massive bust over here. And you can roll up this drug distribution network there. Do you know what the result of that is? A little bit of restriction in supply, which drives up the price of the product, which makes it more attractive for the other suppliers to either increase their efforts to meet that or draws other people into the market as new players to meet it. And so did you come to any conclusions about the, the war on some drugs by the time you finished it? No, unfortunately. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that's the short answer. We really gotta talk to you about your good <laughs> track. <laughs> what I wanted to do is just tell the stories of fourteen musicians who had either that, used, that was really used drugs to, or not. You didn't want to go any wider than that. I didn't want to like get into the stuffiness and statistics and incarceration rates, like all these uh, important topics, which generally uh, muddy or blur with discussion. I just wanted to talk about people mm -hmm. using drugs and why or why not. So, and what's the What's the response to that? You know, I don't think we actually got to the, the, the question I was going to ask you before. Like, what's the stupidest fucking thing you've been asked while you've been promoting this book? Oh, yeah. Um, that was a Canberra radio station. A guy <laughs> asked me... He was taking... It was probably even a harsher, uh, a harder combative stance than the morning show, which he was kind of coming at me quite strongly, which is surprising for some reason. I thought Canberra radio station should be a bit more liberal. Maybe I was wrong. But... Uh, he was saying, so you are a recreational drug user. If you die in a few years' time from a drug overdose, are you going to be happy that this book's your legacy? <laughs> that was essentially the question. What did Which say? was pretty, I was taken aback by. It. And he, <laughs> it's an awesome book, available for 1995. He, kind of, he couched it in like, I hope this doesn't happen. And I'm not suggesting this is going to happen, but if this happens. So, as I said, I, <laughs> as he reached for his breakfast gin under the <laughs> <trouble. laughs> I was a bit taken aback, but then it just allowed me to respond something along the lines of, well, I'm very cautious and considerate and responsible in my use, and I would hope that anyone who is considering using drugs or not, because obviously drugs are not for everyone, uh, they would be as cautious as I am in terms of safe testing kits and moderation and researching what goes into your body before you take it and planning ahead and all these kind of harm minimization responses to something which is inherently risky, which is deciding to take something that is ultimately not very good for you. I mean, that's probably essential to this discussion, like the same way that drinking alcohol is a poison. Uh, these things are foreign substances going into your body that you're choosing to put there because you're expecting a certain feeling at the other end. And yeah, I think that's what we've missed so much in Australian culture in the discussion of drugs is uh, not we're ignoring the reasons why people choose to take things, which is because they want to feel good. We'll go to you guys in, in just a sec. And one last question. How have your subjects found it? Like, what was the response of the, the people you interviewed? Yeah, I've only heard back from two of them of the 14. So it's pretty low response rates. Uh, for many of them, I think it was just another interview. Like the fact that it's going to be in a book maybe wasn't of too much concern or too much interest. Like they're professionals, they're used to talking to journalists. The fact that we spoke for an hour or two about a particular topic maybe it was a bit more interesting than the average interview, but um, the people I heard from was Phil Jamison from Grinspoon, who said that reading his chapter was quite moving because that part of his life, uh, the issues surrounding his addiction was seven years ago. And yeah, it kind of reminded him of how poorly he had behaved to those around him. So he felt a lot of regret, I suppose, around that. And the other one was Steve Kilby, who essentially said, fuck mate, you made me look like a legend. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Nick Harvey is the biggest legend in that book. I mean, if you're going to start, if you, if you, you can read this out of order, just read the Nick Harvey chapter first. Just, yeah, great. I'm talking. Why do you like the Nick Harvey chapter? Oh, I just, you know, because, you know, you get the whole sort of uh, birthday party and 
the cave and, and all of the, the aura of, of madness and, and super indulgence that, that surrounds those guys. And Harvey just comes across as a really angry accountant. <laughs> it's, um, but having said that, you know, he had one of the, the hardest lessons in that whole book, which is that like, even if you yourself uh, are not smashing the gear every day, it can damage you and, and burn you just as deeply if you know, the people who are around you, who depend on you and who you depend on, are doing that. And if you're a manager, like he was for the bad seats for quite some time, he was trying to corral, it was like herding cats. Oh, I felt to that guy. I just, yeah. I, I could just imagine him sitting, seething, you know, at band practice because everyone's off their nut and, you know, they should be practicing. It's, it's, it's a great, great chapter. I'd actually start with that one. I, just I think go to Tina Arena. <laughs> I just want to ask you, John, because you wrote about drugs and falafel and Doplan and other books, and I wanted to know whether what I have to look forward to. How did uh, editors and publishers and the general public receive you after you became, uh, I guess, public in your drug use? What do I have to look forward to now that this book is out? Oh, look, that was. It's really odd. Um, I mean, Falafel was a big change, obviously. I, I'd worked for, like you, I did magazine freelance work for 10 years before Falafel came out. And it's a tough gig. Like, it's really, it, it's hard to pay your rent. Um, and, you know, that's why I give you the side eye, because you make a pretty good living out of freelancing. <laughs> <laughs> Taking money that should be mine. <laughs> but uh, when that book came out, and what Falafel changed was just my, my bank balance. I, 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 never really needed to worry about how I was going to pay the rent after that. But falafel um, was not as important uh, to me as a writer as, as Leviathan was. Um, like after Leviathan, I started to get more like, commissions from, from, I suppose, you know, the sort of the, the mainstream media. Uh, as you know, the, the position of freelancers is really interesting, though the media particularly print media, can't operate without freelancers. Just the on costs of having staff are, are massive, whereas freelancers, you're just paying for the copy, and you're not really paying that much. I suspect, you know, Rolling Stone, what, what do Rolling Stone pay per word now? You can whisper if you want it. 60 cents. Oh, okay. word. No, no, they've, they've gone up. It's, all right. it's still shit, but they've gone up. <laughs> um, yeah, look, the Leviathan changed everything. Falafel didn't. But you you wanted to get away from that uh, early persona. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you're encouraging. Well, no, that's right, because I, like, my original, my <laughs> first love was, was magazine work. I loved writing magazine stories and features. That's all I ever wanted to do. And Falafel, I did as a favour for a friend, because um, the magazine we both worked out was dying. And in, you know, this is Michael Duffy. He wanted to set up a publishing company. So I'll write you a few flatmate stories. And so you know, he gave me four grand, which I, I spent on red wine, hot chips, and amphetamines, and cranked the book out in about five weeks. And um, and then I, that was it. I figured, oh, I've written a book now. That's all I have to do. I don't need to do it again. And uh, as it turned out, I did. But um, this this book. And this is just between us. This book, uh, a this is a great book. What will happen is editors will read this. And, I mean, you've got a good rep anyway, and everyone in the biz will know who you are, and they, they know how good your work is. But once you've actually put your name on a book and put it out there, you've done something that a lot of people in media don't do, which is that you have stood fucking naked in front of the crowd, and you can either be torn down and stomped into the dust for it, or you can be raised up. And the work in this book is good enough that you will be raised up for it. But it's also, it's not a marginal concern, but it's, 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 not, a, um, it's not a topic that's going to be uh, taken up in the mainstream. And this all presupposes that a fucking mainstream media will exist in five years' time, which is a big if. Uh, but we had this discussion at lunch the other day. What you want to look at for your next book, and you really should do a next book because you you're good at it, um, is something very, very different. Like, you know, move away from the, uh, well, well, I'll call it, you know, fringe topics. And I've worked 10 years in the fringe, and it's great, and the stories are fantastic. But uh, it's, it's the fringe, it's not the concerns of most people. Mm -hmm. and 
Now, in the end, you're a storyteller, and people want to hear their stories. So you tell them their stories. Right, that's great advice. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, well, what the book does, I think, is portray the full spectrum of possibilities when it comes to drug use. I think that we as a society are conditioned to only hear about the very extreme negatives of drug use, which is when uh, drug use crosses over into addiction and overdose and death and crime and all these horrible negative outcomes which certainly exist and mental illness brought about by drug use as well. They certainly all exist, but I think it's uh, disingenuous to focus on the negatives in that sense. It's like focusing on the handful of planes that fall out of the sky each year rather than the millions of people who travel around the world successfully. Maybe that's a terrible example, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I really wanted to portray a full spectrum and hopefully through the fact that there are 14 people telling 14 different stories about drug use with different outcomes, I hope that uh, opens up the dialogue so that more people are willing to talk about the other side of the spectrum, which is the positives and all the mutual experiences that people have, rather than just the worst possible outcomes. Thank you. Another question? Oh, a question there in the dark. So, sort of on the same topic, with your, um, like with people who are sensationalists, if they were to read your book, do you think it would encourage them to experiment with drugs, or at least change their opinion? I would hope the latter. Like the thing about drug use is, it's not for everyone, and I don't condone that everyone goes out and tries it because it's just a different way to make you feel. It's a way to alter your perception and your state of mind. So I would hope that someone, if someone is uh, willing enough to read the book with an open mind, they can see that there are other possibilities than the, like I said, the extremes that we hear in the media and uh, politicians focusing on the, the extreme minority of people who experience those extreme. <laughs> negative outcomes. There's a question, oh, a question um, here. Yeah, I have a book for driving the laptop, it's not a big topic, there are some. I haven't read it, I'm just wondering how big topics are, and did it have a phallic symbology? A phallic symbology? No. I'm sorry, I haven't read the book. How many copies, John? <laughs> a lot. Um, <coughs> in Australia, I don't know, about 400,000, I think, um, and then overseas, so I don't know, about 100, 120 or something. And John, do you know how many copies were stolen from bookshops? I, uh, <laughs> you do. I, I got my English publishing deal um, because there were hundreds of copies floating around the UK which had been stolen by the British backpackers from their um, hapless Australian flatmates. <laughs> and they'd taken it back and, and uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't Penguin, it was... Well, what's the Murdoch publishing company? Collins. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, Harper Harper Collins. Harper Collins, yeah, yeah Harper Collins. Yeah, we're trying to figure out who had the rights to this book that seemed to be everywhere on the, the subway for a couple of, on the tram for a couple of weeks in London. And um, in the end, they discovered there was no British publisher. Mm -hmm. It was just oh. hundreds and hundreds of stolen fucking copies. <laughs> what about you, Fiona? How many copies oh, you get? I, <laughs> yeah. I, get, I get paid for it anyway. So. <laughs> it's all good. If you're the... going to steal books, kids, do it the old-fashioned way. Don't do it on the internet. <laughs> 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 read it. Do it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was sort of wondering how, I think you mentioned, Andrew, but like how much time on average you spent with each of these interviewees, and then there were also some strategies to try and get them to open up, I guess. Like, did you did you go in with a lot of chutzpah, or did you have to kind of like, you know, really sort of... Yeah, you know, what was the change from interviewing to interviewing? Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? I spent between 45 minutes and four hours with my interviewees. 
uh, Tina Arena was the shortest one. She, she had to go after soundcheck. She was playing <laughs> really, really Brisbane good. City Hall that night. And I don't know if it's really good because I just I felt your pain all the way through that chat. <laughs> it's really good. The longest was Spencer T. Jones, who likes a chat, and we sat for four hours at a pub in Melbourne, and he laid out his life story in quite a lot of detail, which was great. Mm. Uh, I kept the interviews quite free form. I didn't have a list of questions to work from. The same question I asked everyone to start with, though, was uh, how were drugs framed for you growing up, right. whether by your parents or those around you? And that kind of made them cast their mind back, and then we kind of go chronologically from there. So that, that worked quite well for me. Yeah. A question down here. Hi, I was really interested in the crossover between uh, drug use and the creativity, given that they're all musicians and they're creating music and performing. Um, I haven't read the book yet, so I'm wondering if there were any of your interviewees who resisted decreasing or stopping their substance use because they were worried about not um, being able to be as creative in their music? Um, well, the majority of people I spoke to were able to draw a distinction between their work life and their, their leisure time, and those who used drugs successfully, like I said earlier, were those who could do that. Um, Two examples come to mind. One is Bertie Blackman, who talked about um, she had been on antidepressants for a few years, which is a form of drug that we don't discuss very often, perhaps. But she she was concerned. Uh, she kind of fought against the idea of antidepressants because she thought it would dull her creativity, and she was pleased to find that that wasn't the case. But she thinks she was lucky to find um, the right antidepressant the first time around. I think it was Zoloft for her. And she had a good psych too, didn't she? Because he actually said to her, you know, that's, if you feel that the muse is dying, then we're going to dial this drug right back. And he, he worked with her to make sure that he, he wasn't killing whatever it was that, that made her an artist by medicating her. And yeah, the uh, majority of people, the musicians I spoke to, um, some of them tried to reflect those drug experiences back through their music. Um, an example is Earth Boy, the hip-hop artist. He would, he used to try and write while high, while smoking weed, and then he kind of decided that, hang on, if I can trust my abilities as a writer while I'm sober, and if, then, then if I have to use uh, pot as a, a kind of carrot to try to incentivize myself, isn't that just uh, negating my own abilities? Like, it's an interesting concept of people who think, or particularly hip-hop artists, I suppose, who have this image where they, uh, people expect them to be high all the time on weed and uh, trying to write and perform music. And those two things aren't necessarily conducive. You know, performing while under the influence of anything, even alcohol, is, can be quite difficult. So I think it was interesting that so much of what I guess I had expected or presupposed about the topic is just built into image. and. Certainly, the musicians themselves kind of play into that by sometimes, uh, you know, we expect them to act a certain way, but the reality is, if you want to put on a good show, you have to be in the moment and sober most of the time. Do we have another question for Andrew? A burning question? Okay, I think that's... Oh, yeah. <coughs> I was just going to ask, what, um, how did you choose who to interview and how many did you ask before you got your 12? I asked about 100 people, 100 musicians, and uh, those who I chose are the ones who said yes. That's <laughs> 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 a simple, simple answer. Uh, Did you run just the hoodies? I did. I mean, pretty much any artist you can think of who isn't in the book I've asked. Like any well-known mainstream artist, I approached them or their managements, and they said, said no. Unfortunately, but I'm very glad that 14 said yes because I think it's an important topic to discuss. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Andrew, have your stories influenced your choices of recreation for drugs? So the question was, um, have their responses, the 14 artists, um, their responses to drugs, has that uh, influenced um, Andrew's own yeah, I go back to that Paul Kelly quote that I mentioned earlier. It's just about respect. If you don't respect drugs, they won't respect you. And if anything, I was quite naive when I first uh, had the idea for the book and when I first pitched it. But during that time, in the last two years, I've become more cautious and more respectful of having spoken to these people who have experienced such a wide range of possibilities when it comes to this topic. So 
um, if, if anything, I've become more cautious and more respectful, which I think is kind of a smart way to approach it, rather than jumping into excess. Well, this is actually a launch, and not just a Q&A. So it falls to me to now declare this book well and truly fired up and launched. <laughs> you can take yourself through to the retail bucket, <laughs> slam a few copies down inside, give them a big hand.